Good afternoon, everybody. You are very welcome to the uh, Centre for Studies of Higher Education webinar series. This is our 11th in a row. Um, we are delighted to have with us this afternoon um, two speakers who are going to co-present co um, and they're going to tell us about intercultural learning, embedding in intercultural learning opportunities in teaching and explore the practical tools that they have. So we have Dr. Aideen Quilty, Associate Professor of Gender Studies and Social Justice, and Dr. Kleena Sullivan, who is a physiotherapist by trade and associate professor here at UCD. So without further ado, ado I would like to invite Kleena to begin the presentation. Um, thank you very much, Kleena. Great, um, thank you, David. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay and, and see the slides okay. So um, Aideen and I thought that we would um, start off um, by just talking for a few moments about each of our paths into the, the teaching fellowship, um, which was called Teaching uh, Across Cultures. As David said, I am a physiotherapist and I, by profession, and I work at the moment in uh, UCD in the um, School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Sciences. But in my life before that, um, in UC before UCD, I worked as a clinical physiotherapist in, in three different health systems here in Ireland, in the UK and in Burkina Faso in West Africa. And I suppose that experience, um, I suppose, was, you know, very informative to me because I worked in different contexts, but also worked with, with um, colleagues and with patients from, from, diverse, from, from diverse contexts and diverse groups. In my role here in UCD, then, I was very lucky to be programme director of our first graduate entry programme in physiotherapy, which saw a lot of international students, about half the students on that programme uh, were international students. And that, I suppose, gave me a, a bird's eye view or a really good understanding of the realities for our international students when, when they come to study with us in UCD and um, the different challenges they face getting used to Ireland and Dublin, but also within UCD getting used to our education system and also because it's a clinical program, the, the different challenges they had um, going out on, on, on to clinical placement. Um, and then finally, I've, I've had the, the pleasure of being involved with um, student outbound mobility with UCD volunteers overseas for a number of years where um, our physiotherapy students again travel to, to uh, countries like Uganda and, and India. And I suppose I just you know, had the opportunity to see the impact on that on our, on our students um, in, in terms of their, their intercultural learning opportunity. So when this call was announced for a fellowship in teaching across cultures, I didn't know Aideen, um, but I did put in an application and, uh, um, and was very lucky um, uh, to, to work with Aideen on this fellowship over, over the two years and would highly recommend anybody listening to, you know, to, to, to do put themselves forward for the various fellowships in, in, in teaching. I learned a huge amount, gained a huge amount from it, really enjoyed working with Aideen and I hope as well that it's a piece of work that, that has impact and will continue to have impact in, in UCD. So that, that was my path to the fellowship. Aideen, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Kleena. Um, yeah, so our, our paths were, were similar in many ways, but, but, but very different. And I think actually that's been a key strength of the fellowship and how it developed. And, and, and to, to start with Kleena's endpoint, you know, one of the, the, the huge positives of this fellowship was working with Kleena, uh, working with somebody from the, the life sciences. So we had the opportunity to look at our project through the social sciences and the life sciences, and also to develop a friendship, which was a total bonus um, throughout the process. So my, the, the photograph that I have on screen, I'm, I'm taking the photograph and I'm looking into that room and it's, it's, it's a room in, in a house, in a housing estate in Ronanstown in Clondalk in, in West Dublin, would have um, lots of areas of designated socioeconomic disadvantage, desk schools, um, et cetera. Behind me in that photograph, what you can see is there's an island and an oven, it's a fully fitted kitchen, and that's a teaching space. Um, it's one of our teaching spaces from a community outreach um, university partnership program that I've been directing for about 20 years. And so when I saw the call, you know, for teaching across cultures, my immediate kind of culture lens was drawn to those sorts of contexts. And whilst Kleena had the international piece, for me, it was our home students, our domestic students, and very, very particularly um, through the, the, the lens or prism of, of, of race and class with both of those as kind of cultural identities. Um, I've learned a huge amount from working with our partners in the community. 
And so the 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 idea then was for Cleana and I to to pool that expertise um, in in our research project and and hopefully grow and and develop new knowledges. And that's that's what we set out to do. So what we're going to do, we've kind of we've you know divided this up, and it's hopefully it won't be too fractured. But we've got kind of sections that we're going to do. Uh, but really, what we want to achieve in in the next thirty or so minutes is to raise some further awareness around intercultural education, intercultural learning, deepen some understandings and deepening those understandings by thinking through the what, the why and the how of intercultural learning. So we're going to take a look at the research project um, and findings first, and then we're going to take a particular look at the 101 intercultural tool that we developed um, as one of the, the, the key outputs um, from this project. Thanks, Kalina. Um, so we're going to go on um, to the, a kind of an, an end point or an output, but I'm going to start here, use this as a kind of a land point. And it's the definition of intercultural learning that Kalina and I developed through the project. But we started it in draft form at a relatively early stage. And so I want to present the definition and then say something about, you know, what our journey was to arriving at, at this, this particular definition and why we, why we settled on intercultural. Um, so the definition intercultural learning is about the opportunities and experiences of working with and learning from people across different cultures. And, and some of the, the important words there, the notion of, of opportunity, what that might be, these sorts of experiences, we're gonna speak more to those as, as we go through. So from a, a broad kind of, fellow that was about teaching and learning across cultures and um, how did we end up at this intercultural frame well our starting point was to kind of engage in a deep um, conceptual immersion in the concept of culture uh, so it's it's one of those tricky words and um, it's deeply conceptual but it's also part of of the everyday it's it's you know up there amongst the second and third most complex words in the english language and got about 160 operational definitions so in order to to get a sense of our understandings of culture we started to engage with the literature and culture and particularly culture in relation to higher education institutions is is considered through a whole lot of these different kind of conceptual pathways we might call them Multicult multiculturalism international internationalization diversity cross-cultural global citizen global citizenship cosmopolitanism all of these were um, ideas and concepts that we we started to think through but at the end of all of our thinking was really to arrive on interculturalism and and we 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 were happy to kind of settle onto the, this intercultural space and um, when we looked at everything in the round we felt that actually this was the most ideologically interesting and relevant and useful to us as we started this interrogation of higher education. We never saw any of those conceptual gateways or frameworks uh, as being in competition and there was definitely no hierarchy. And, and indeed, we don't see them as oppositional to us having drawn the intercultural frame. Why we were really drawn to it, there's been a surge in intercultural thinking and scholarship and intellectualization over the last 15 years. And, and like all of them, there are, you know, criticisms that we can we can bring to bear. But despite those criticisms, we were certainly persuaded by the openness and the fluidity and the dialogue and the interaction um, that intercultural as a, as a word and a concept offered to us um, as we were seeking to respond to not just our complex world globally, geopolitically, but also our increasingly complex higher education institutions. And then the other um, real strength that we felt that the intercultural lens brought, it kind of oper operates like kind of a mothership. It hovers over the institution. So if we see UCD as operating within the multiculturalism, cosmopolitanism, all those things, interculturalism allows us a lens to hold all of those together, draw from them as we want, but to be focusing on the institution and our students in the round. So in a, an institution where we've got, you know, the ubiquitousness of, of EDI, diversity, equality, or equity, inclusion, th this is a way for us to be able to hold those and access and lifelong learning and widening participation, 
where they might all have a specificity on occasion, but actually it allows us to step back from that and to, to take in the full picture. So. I think it's over to me now, Aideen. Yeah, and <laughs> what I was gonna say was, from the beginning, we wanted to have a definition that would allow us to interrogate really the higher education institutions and these broader geo, uh, global political contexts. Um, thanks, Kleena. Yeah, so I, I suppose Aideen has just given a kind of a, an overview there of the, of the different discussions, conversations, arguments that that we had and and you know you know the 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 very vast i suppose kind of literature that that we we looked at as well which was all very very new certainly to me and i certainly grappled with it at at, at various points through throughout the fellowship but I suppose one of the things that, you know, building on what Aideen was saying, once we settled on, on interculturalism, we needed to consider, well, why, why is this important to higher education? Um, and that kind of drove, drove us to, to discuss and consider, I, what, well, what is the goal of higher education? What, what, what is, our, what is our, our, our purpose? And, you know, I suppose when we think about the, the UCD strategy, rising to the future, in, in, in a nutshell, the, the purpose is really about creating graduates who are able to go forward and, and, and address global challenges. Um, and I suppose just looking at the, the different things I have on the slide there, um, the objectives of our UCD strategy really align very closely with the sustainable, the UN Sustainable Development Goals agenda, which is really a, a blueprint for peace and prosperity for, for people and the planet today and, and going forward. So as, as I was certainly grappling with a lot of this literature and, and concept, different conceptual frames to underpin our fe fellowship, I happened to go to a conferring ceremony, a graduation ceremony here in UCD back in December of 2019. And during that ceremony, Professor Thomas Sterner, who's a professor of environmental economics at the University of Gothenburg, was confer conferred with an honorary um, doctorate. And during his, his speech, he spoke about, I suppose, global challenges and talked about the two key global challenges being the climate crisis and also poor world political leadership. And he thought he talked about then the purpose of higher education being to instill the values of knowledge, truth and, and, and tolerance into, you know, to our students and, and graduates. And that for me was, a, you know, kind of a moment where it, it brought together all of the discussions and, and readings that I had done uh, and, um, with, with, with Aideen um, and, and kind of, you know, I suppose placed where our fellowship was um, within the context of, of higher education. So um, our, our fellowship, you know, I suppose, as Aideen said, you know, certainly has kind of um, underpinnings in inter internationalization and and widening participation as well but I'm going to focus in in the internationalization piece for for a moment so the reality for us in UCD which is is fantastic um, um for us is that classroom diversity in in our classrooms is now the norm rather than than the um than the exception in UCD and we know that classroom diversity internationalization is absolutely crucial to the quality of higher education that we can offer and the relevance of higher um, uh, the relevance of higher education. And I'm going to quote Sue Robson here, who was one of our, our mentors during the fellowship, where she says a key benefit of internationalization should be the opportunities to develop international and cross-cultural perspectives to prepare them for the role for their role in a globalized workplace and an increasingly global economy so the reality for all of our graduates is that they are going to be working in you know very highly networked interconnected and globalized world and within that, they're also going to be working in contexts where there's deep rooted societal divisions. And we think about, I suppose, tensions after the, in the US after 2016 elections, Brexit, tensions in Northern Ireland and, um, and, and the European migration crisis as, as just, you know, contexts that are existing locally to us at the moment. So there is a huge need for, for our students, you know, that we are instilling those values of, of knowledge, truth and um, tolerance. 
So um, I've just pulled here just uh, just a, another uh, conceptual frame, I suppose, in, in terms of, of um, the benefits, what the benefits to internationalization are. And this is from Simon Mar Martinson. And he talks about the benefits of higher, um, sorry, benefits of higher education being individual, collective, national and global and how they intersect. So, for example, higher education gives uh, gives graduates higher, uh, better employment opportunities and early earning potential. And also it affords them the, the opportunity perhaps to for cross border working and, and intercultural skills and communication skills. In terms of, of the collective, higher education uh, contributes to stronger professions and stronger um, societies, societal inputs to government, stronger cities and um, societal transformation. And again, you know, in terms of the collective global um, facilitators with things like global society, global science and um, opportunities for diverse fields of thought and uh, diverse mobility as well. And Aideen and I strongly felt that intercultural learning was a key vehicle to, or, um, and, or a key mechanism to move um, and achieve the benefits of higher education, to move from the individual to the collective, from the national to the global. So that just brings us to the end of, of um, a little bit of the, the background um, and context of, of our fellowship. Thanks, Kleena. So like once, once we had that phase of the project done, uh, the immersion in the literature and landing on interculturalism, um, our next challenge was to enter into the, the, the research design phase. So what was it we were going to do in, uh, as part of this um, fellowship project? And so we identified our key question as to explore staff and students' experiences and perceptions of intercultural teaching and learning. And uh, as, Kleena had said, we were really mindful of the importance of this as a piece of work. And of course, the fellowship, um, the fact that it existed and it had identified teaching and learning across cultures as a theme um, suggested that institutionally, this was also seen to be important. Um, as Kleena said, our classrooms are increasingly diverse. Um, our staff profile, it's not half as diverse as it, as it should be, but it's certainly moving in that direction. But then we have an institutional obligation to be able to respond to that diversity um, and to have it reflected positively and dynamically uh, across our policies and our pedagogies and our learning environments. So we were drawn to social scientific qualitative methodologies uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, we were mindful that this needed to be a rigorous piece of research. It needed to be heavily bound within ethical considerations. We were going to be working with students, with staff, and, and interculturalism, people's experiences of it, we were mindful that they may not have been positive. Um, and, and those sorts of considerations needed to be stitched into not just our like seeking ethical approval, but then how we approached every um, element of, of the research design. We also wanted this to be relevant and useful. Um, and, and we come to that when we get towards the end, when we're looking at the toolkit, but it was also useful in informing um, potential policy developments uh, across the universe. We've spoken to the, the literature um, in terms of the kind of conceptual development of, of the project, but we also engaged in literature around methodologies and the different kinds of methodologies that would allow us to, to really drill into to the, the, and, and respond to the research question we'd asked. And so we identified two kind of area focus groups and then artifacts as, as a kind of a qualitative arts-based method um, as the most appropriate to help us answer the questions. And from the beginning and throughout every step, we were kind of trying to think through and highlight and make explicit the teaching and learning implications. So what did we do? We, we, had, we carried out um, six focus groups in total. We also, you know, we hit that, that part of the, the, the global experience over the last two years of, of, of COVID. And that was, it was deeply challenging, but it was also fascinating. 
in that we'd had half those focus groups were done in person. And we had the wonderful energy and dynamism that came through from having people in, in, in those groups speaking uh, to a topic that was clearly important to them and resonated hugely with them. Um, but then we had to respond to COVID. And so that lovely kind of you know phrase, we pivoted online. And, and we had an equally uh, dynamic set of experiences, um, which really surprised, it surprised both of us. And they, they, were, they were slightly differently nuanced, those focus groups, but the, the richness of the engagement was apparent across both forms. Um, and there's been kind of deep learning, I think, for, for that experience for us as researchers. We had 32 participants in total, and that was a combination of undergraduate and graduate students. And staff we had included faculty and support and clinical staff. And this is one of the areas where you can see very, very clearly um, the relationship between social sciences and the health sciences. The, the, the kind of clinical staff and support staff, this is something that was hugely apparent um, in across the, the, the kinds of programs, the physio programs that Kleena uh, and colleagues were involved in. It's, it, it's less so, not wholly, but it, it's less um, prominent within the social sciences in, in some of our own disciplines. Um, the themes we were exploring in the focus groups were experiences of, of intercultural learning, the roles that people identified within that, value, um, if there was such a value to be attributed, and then the sorts of skills that um, might be important. The artifacts became a way to really help us um, explore and it was a multi-pronged device. And this kind of, it grew legs almost as we went through. Uh, initially, we were really mindful of the fact that from our own research, we knew the challenges of dealing with the word culture. We knew the challenges and asking people to reflect on something that is so multifaceted. And the artifacts gave us a way into those conversations. So they're, they're everything from, you know, pieces of paper, writing, everyday objects that that somebody might identify as saying something to them about their experience of intercultural learning. So it doubled up as an icebreaker. So people were comfortable coming in with their artifact, but it, they also prompted really, really deep um, kind of meaningful conversation between participants as to understandings of what intercultural um, learning and education was. So they were definitely, they contributed to the kind of valuable insights and findings and outputs um, that, that we, we had. And, and Cleena now is going to take us through um, some of those, those findings. Yeah, so, so just very quickly, I suppose this is a high level, very high level overview of, of our findings. And, and then we will go into a, a kind of a framework and, and give some details of the, of the toolkit that we had as well as an output. So um, the first one is that uh, I suppose that, that we found was that staff and students really valued uh, interculturalism and they considered it important and relevant to their learning and uh, crucial to broadening their own um, insights and understandings. Uh, students felt that the diverse that UCD had a valuable resource in terms of its diverse student community. But that this um, was somewhat hidden and an underutilized vehicle for, in, under, um, for intercultural learning in UCD. Participants highlighted a lack of awareness of the value and relevance of intercultural learning among staff in UCD. And often the, the benefits of internationalization and having a diverse student community were predominantly overshadowed or perceived as narrow economic gains and market targets in relation to internationalization rather than opportunities for richer inclusive education experiences and, and broader meeting the broader social goals of higher education and um, staff reported that there remained a competing tension to balance time and space required for meaningful opportunities for intercultural learning and developing these with, within their teaching spaces with students with responsibilities around research and um, having you know increasing student numbers with, within programs as well and then um you know in terms of the teaching and learning strategies both students and staff gave excellent examples and advice about how, how, how to do it, how, how to best do it. 
And what we have done is we've um, collated these very practical strategies and recommendations into a, an intercultural teaching and learning one-on-one -on -one tool. And I will go through that at, towards the end of, of today's presentation. So Aideen. So one of the other kind of outputs or findings um, was the, the development of a new conceptual framework that, that underpins our definition of intercultural learning but it's also really framed how we have now moved into our understanding of uh, both what intercultural learning um, is within our higher education institutions, but why it's, it's so important. I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to, to, to go through it. So it's got four kind of platforms, um, opportunities and competencies. Anybody who's you know, familiar with this space at all will you know, not be surprised to see those two there. Um, a lot of the literature talks about the importance of creating opportunities, whether they're formal, informal, non-formal, in campus, on campus, in the classroom, outside of the university, opportunities for people to actually connect. Um, and the competencies, again, there's a raft of literature um, detailed in competencies. Um, and these kind of intercultural competencies, the, the, the frameworks are all there. But as we were, as we were both well informed by the literature um, that we've done, but also as we were going through the focus groups, it was clear to us that there was, we were calling it something more, the moreness of this intercultural piece wasn't quite captured in these two. There was something else happening. People were talking about other things in more meaningful ways than just the opportunities and competencies, which were clearly important. Um, one of the things um, so many people talk, talked about was relationships and a sense of connectivity or, or belonging. And, and that that was hugely important to how they, they were experiencing um, their higher education uh, journey or world. And, and the other one that came through in different ways from participants, staff and students um, was the power dynamics that were underpinning all of these, who was creating the opportunities, who could access them, who was a, 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 identifying what sorts of competencies or skills were important and um, who was creating the terms of engagement. So we were going to look through that then through this notion of agency because it was all about people having the, 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 the capacity to make choices and um, inform choices, but also then to be empowered to act on those. So our response to the kind of existing literature was to say, that's all fantastic, it's highly relevant, but we need something more and this was the, the moreness that we identified. Thanks, Kleena. So all I'm gonna do is I've just identified a quote um, for each of those to hopefully make them more meaningful and these were for, for um, from our students directly. So when we were asking about opportunities, we were asking about, you know, how can, how can we create them? Um, and so this student said, for me, this is quite out of my depth. In my course, there's no conversations like this or anything like that. So even this conversation for someone like me is really eye-opening where you take away things. So yeah, just conversations like this, really, I think this has been amazing. Now that participant was talking about the focus group. So we were able to then start to rethink even methodologically of the focus group in itself as an opportunity for an intercultural encounter. Um, but this student, it was a research project that this student entered into that allowed them an opportunity for a first time conversation. Um, so it really highlighted the importance of us actively um, setting out to craft these opportunities. And then in relatedness, um, I mean, the key question was like, how do we build meaningful relationships um, in our institutions? And that was among peers, between peers and staff, among staff and colleagues. And I've chosen this, this because it speaks in the negative, in the reverse almost, to the importance of relatedness. So this is one of our students, our international students who said, because as for me, I'm always in such a confusion status because I'm Chinese. Sometimes I don't feel inclusive in this society, but also I don't feel I can get inclusive back in China because I have the different value with my people. Some of them are really patriotic or pro-communist party, but I'm not. And most of my other Chinese friends are the same with them. So sometimes it feels like an orphan. Sorry. And I remember when that participant um, 
said those words in the focus group. And Clea and I were both deeply, deeply moved and affected by that. But what it spoke to us as we went through and heard other kinds of comments was the importance actually of belonging and inclusion. Inclusion was a word so many participants um, referenced. But, but we all know that once we have questions of inclusion on the table, we also have an equal measure of the potential for people to be excluded. Or is this student captured being in this kind of almost in between liminal space where they felt deeply marginalized? Um, thus reinforcing that the need for these kind of deep, meaningful relationships. And then moving on to competencies. You know, the competencies, as I've said, they're all over the literature. Um, but I think this captures, comp you know, the competencies in the round, and it was the way that we started to think about them as well. So the student said, it's not just diversity of numbers, it's inclusiveness that matters. And the workforce of the future is about being inclusive and being emotionally intelligent. So the more they get of it at universities, the better they are a skilled future workforce, just like with digital skills. Now, what that reinforced was a broader um, understanding and conceptualization of what these competencies were by our students. And we see that in the next slide where, so this student was talking about being emotionally intended. What we were clear kind of to try to capture in how we wrote this up was that competencies was a, like a move beyond just an intellectual quotient, uh, the importance of knowing. It was also about the intellectual quotient blended and melded with the emotional quotient and the cultural quotient, these qu um, cultural understandings. And of course, we were also hearing that one of the challenges to these competencies that people had was fear. It was fear of getting it wrong that they wouldn't have these competencies and that they would aggravate a situation that they were just not competent enough to get involved. Um, so that brought us to then our final one, um, agency, and, and the need for people to be empowered and also resourced um, to deal with the sorts of power dynamics that were maybe preventing some people from, from being involved. So this student says, I do think institutionally, these schools absolutely, without a doubt, have a responsibility to educate people that are going to be professionals in positions that gives them power. They should understand that there is a power difference between a professional and a patient, be it a physio, a doctor, you know what I mean? And that culture, people's different cultural identities, be it race, class, ethnicity, whatever it may be, has a huge bearing on that as well. And that gave us a, a really clear way in to think more broadly. Um, about interculturalism through this intersectional lens of, of, of individuals with these complex identities drenched in, in power relations. Yep. Thanks, Kleena. Great, so it's back to me now. Um, so what I'm gonna do in the next couple of minutes is, is just um, outline one of the key outputs from the fellowship, which was an intercultural teaching and learning 101 tool. And David, I just sent you an email there actually with the link, perhaps you can pop it in the chat. I actually was going to do it myself, but I was afraid it would mess up the, the PowerPoint presentation. So um, this, this link, uh, there's, the tool is on the teaching and learning website, so you can access it in your own time and um, have, have, have a look through it. But really, I suppose this tool was designed for anybody teaching with UCD, sorry, in UCD, who wishes to introduce um, some activities within the classroom to promote intercultural learning. And it, it really consists of seven reflective questions, and I, we're going to go through those in, in, a, in a moment, and it gives some suggestions and examples. And what I really need to say is that the suggestions and examples are really simple and you are probably doing many of them all already. Um, so just to st start off with, with the first one um, it, around introduction or orientation. And the questions here are, do students get an opportunity to introduce themselves to each other and to you and you to them on, on your module? Do students get the opportunity to interact informally, perhaps during orientation at program level or early in the morning? And I think, or early in the morning, early in a module, excuse me. So I think we're all familiar maybe with a classroom space where students from certain, um, you know, maybe countries or regions in the world cluster together at, in, in one corner of, of the classroom. 
And students told us during the focus groups that really the first step in intercultural um, dialogue or conversation is the opportunity to have uh, to tell one's own story. And they valued being given that opportunity within the classroom. They valued um, being give, given the to hear about Ireland and Irish culture from their Irish peers, but also to share their 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 own stories. Um, so again, you know, um, you know, I suppose considering ring fencing time early in a trimester to allow students to have a, a little bit of informal um, chit chat and engineering, I suppose the the, the student and um, the makeup or, or the constituents of, of, of that uh, student group. And that brings me to the to another to the next one, which is a very related one um, around group work and group work is a key vehicle for intercultural learning and um, so the reflective questions here are um, are there opportunities for students to work in groups on your module or program what kind of group work would lend itself to your module and learning outcomes and are the groups diverse in terms of citizenship and um, gender and age and I, I suppose we have to be conscious that we don't want to overburden students with, with more group work. And I know certainly in, in my own field of physiotherapy, sometimes students uh, complain if they have too many group assignments or, or, or group projects. Um, but we can make group work quite low stakes. Again, it can be, um, you know, uh, informal uh, discussions, uh, conversation classes, um, role play, case-based scenarios, that sort of thing. So again, just, and, uh, you know, being mindful to engineer the, the groups so that they, the, the constituents within the groups are, are, are quite diverse. And um, the next one is in terms of internationalization of um, the curriculum. So it is good where possible and, and where relevant that the curriculum reflects other contexts rather than just Irish or European or North, North uh, American contexts. Because by doing so, students are introduced to different systems and different ways of doing. So again, um, ensuring that reading lists and the examples that we used are, are rooted in diverse contexts and perspectives. So again, the reflective questions here are, you know, reviewing um, your supporting material reading list resources. Do the writings relate to diverse contexts and cultures? Are the authors from diverse cultural contexts and are the examples that you use in, in your teaching set in different cultures and, and contexts? And related to this is um, a consideration of the diversity of contributors. So it is common in some programs to have multiple internal and external contributors to modules and programs and students really value different voices contributing to their programs, again to broaden their, ex their exposure to different experiences and perspectives. So again, considering, you know, um, inviting a, a range of contributors, but also leveraging some online resources. So for example, podcasts, movies, or, or e-webinars that are available online can, can, can be um, a very useful way to, to ensure um, a diversity of contributors to, to modules and programs. And the next one is, I, I suppose, space for intercultural um, learning. Intercultural learning and, and setting it up with a, within classes takes time and ideally should be threaded through modules and programs and um, conversations, discussions, encounters and storytelling are, are considered simple but, but key vehicles for intercultural learning. And such interactions um, may and do occur within and outside the classroom, both as formal and informal um, learning. But I suppose taking time to, you know, to create space within the curriculum for informal interactions, such as discussions and conversations. Um, and again, they, these can take place in the physical environment, face-to-face -face teaching or, or online as well through, through uh, discussion boards or, or, or Zoom sessions. And then, um, this is the last one from me before I hand you back to to Aideen, but um, you know, considering the visibility of intercultural learning within your programs or or modules, is intercultural learning a goal of your teaching? Is it visible to students? Is it articulated in the learning outcomes? Is it assessed? So as, as we said earlier, students value intercultural learning as a mechanism to ensure that as graduates, they are equipped 
for the global workforce. And they did, students strongly told us that we're not leveraging it, the classroom diversity as, as much as, as it should be. So perhaps we need to consider that it is more visible in the curriculum and you know, consider, can it be embedded into program philosophies, articulated in program goals or module goals? And achievement of intercultural skills can be incorporated incorporated into assessed work as well, for example, through reflective essays, logbooks, or engagement with, with discussion boards. So there are just a few uh, kind of simple strategies uh, to, to pick up and, and, and consider. So Aideen, over to you then. Great, thanks. And just as we kind of wrap this up and bring it to a close, um, that the seventh one was how might we use artifacts to drive intercultural learning? And we were inspired by that because of the, the effectiveness of the artifacts uh, methodologically in the focus group. Then our question was, well, how would we use them otherwise? And I had always been using prompts um, to, to at the start of most of my classes and particularly graduate classes where there's complex kind of ideas and um, on the table. But you see that I've got there's two in particular I'm going to highlight. So one is here down in, in the bottom left corner. It's, it's, a, it's a coffee pot. It's actually, it's an Ethiopian coffee pot. And just to remind you that all we did was we, we said to people, we gave them a tiny little blurb on, look, this is what artifacts are. Um, artifacts can be anything. They can include photographs, items of clothing, poetry, multimedia, imagery, whatever. Um, but is there a connection between what you bring in and maybe what you understand by intercultural learning? So we gave them time to, to think about it. So I want to highlight the, the um, coffee pot and to bring us back kind of full circle to where Kleena and I started this project from. So Kleena and her extensive expertise with VO and internationalization, and then mine with we're domestic and, and home students. So we're gonna take a second example in a sec. So Kleena, if you just go back to the coffee pot for a second, um, the Ethiopian student said that um, she was conscious before she came here that she was going to be in residences. And that she would, you know, she really needed to be able to develop relationships with people. Now, if you think about the ORCA frame, she was doing everything on the ORC and, uh, of that. She brought the coffee pot with her. She then set up these intercultural encounters with the people who she shared the residence with. And that was a prompt for conversation and shared stories. She also said it gave her a deep sense of connection back to home that she brought with her into kind of being here. And, and across all of that is just her being an agentic, you know, fantastic graduate student. Um, so that was an example of, of how it just, oh, it just spoke to, I think, everything we were doing in the project. And then the second example was from one of our, our other students, a home student, thanks, Kleena. And I'm going to read a, a quote from her. So um, they had a, a Nike jacket. Um, I brought a Nike jacket. A big part of what I would call my cultural identity is rooted in class, and it's maybe true that different experiences of education I've had, it's not usually encouraged to think of a working class identity as a cultural identity, but I think very much it is and has been suppressed or attempted institutionally to be suppressed at every level. And they spoke powerfully about the suppression of classes and identity at primary, second level and third level education. Um, and Kleena, if you go on to the next one, we see, you actually see the Nike jacket there, but that's an example of the, the raft of, of artifacts that the participants, staff and students uh, brought in. So for like it, us in our, in our teaching moving forward, because it gives control to students, um, they have control over what they want to say when they step into the space. It kind of attempts to rebalance um, the power dynamics uh, that are at play in these kinds of exchanges. But it also then fostered all sorts of kind of over and back conversations between participants, um, both in the focus groups and, and outside. So to just close this off then, um, our intercultural next steps. So we are continuing to contribute to scholarship through publications uh, based on the fellowship research. Uh, we are in process and train of building an intercultural uh, community of practice uh, in UCD. Uh, we, no, we are doing that with all sorts of colleagues across the university, and it's very much been, been led out of teaching and learning, which is fantastic. So again, that kind of um, fulsome understanding that it's important that if we're a diverse institution, 
we need to put our money where our mouth is really and we need to be doing the intercultural work and embedding it in our practice. Um, we're in, engaged in awareness raising of the importance of interculturalism in UCD. It's part of actually uh, that process here. And also then sharing the one-on-one intercultural tool with colleagues across disciplines and um, using the website seminars, also planning um, an event around the artifacts um, to try to foster you know, uh, further dialogue and conversation with colleagues and students. I think, Tina, are you happy with that? That's us. Yeah. That's done. done. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everyone. And to for the invitation as well, um, David, from the seat. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much, Kleena and Aideen. And in fact, <clears throat> if I may say, I think we've kind of um, been very lucky because we've got not only your kind of methodological discussion but obviously kind of the you know the toolkit that's come out of that so we've got two presentations for the price of one really um <clears throat> if there are any questions please um step up i have a question straight up if i may um and it really comes out of the artifacts because obviously that triggered something in me immediately in terms of the power of those and the ability to actually you know use them as a as a trigger event almost uh, and obviously Aiding going on in the details there and the amount of different examples um, that people brought in. May I ask perhaps a, a good, an awkward question? How do you think you and I, as kind of faculty, as kind of teaching staff, as support staff, could utilize that same prospect in our everyday practice? I might come in there first because I, I you know, when Aiding first suggested the, the artifacts to me when we were designing our methodology, I swear to say, Aiding, it, it took a while to, to <laughs> convince me because it was just not in, in my usual frame of thinking. And now I use it all the time, David. I use it with our undergraduate and our graduate physio students um, around different aspects, thinking about global health, thinking about uh, a, a cultural competency for clinical practice. And I also use it early, early in the curriculum. So I, I use it, I, I suppose, but I, I always st um, start it off um, to give students um, from Ireland and from across the world the opportunity to, and I say to them, bring in something that reflects your culture. And it's actually absolutely wonderful to see how it transforms a room. Um, and they, they um, and it also hands over the power within a classroom to the student. And I remember Aideen saying that to me, and I probably didn't quite believe you, Aideen, but um, it actually is, um, re you know, really highly effective. And it gives students as well, you know, you know, I've had students just recently in the last couple of weeks talk about their their religion, you know, their how their you know things like their religion and how that forms a key part of their own identity and. Um, and it gives them that kind of safe space. I think it's kind of it's, it's a physical object that everybody can look at as somebody is, is talking about something that's very deep and personal to them. So um, and it yeah, it, it's actually really, really powerful. So um, and as I say, I use it to, you know, with some groups to to introduce them to thinking about inclusive healthcare practice. I use it um, for other groups to think about um, uh, health systems and global health and global health inequity. So I use it as a kind of a starting point to, to build into kind of deeper conversations that in sometimes in health sciences where it can be very black and white, is there evidence, is there not evidence? But the reality in our working, you know, is as health workers, is we, we work in the gray all, all the time and students get that when they leave UCD and go out to clinical practice. But I find in the classroom, it's just a really nice way of, of talking about the gray, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? <clears throat> 